we what we have here today is the flow of the webinar and we really do want to make it an interactive session we know that a lot of um people in the audience also have their own experiences so we're going to be having experience sharing from the different partners we're really lucky to have adelina kamal with us from the aha center to also reflect on what we're hearing in this discussion and share her uh, opinions and experiences and we'll also open the floor to question and answer and we know again many of you have uh, experiences and are dealing as well in this new normal. So a chance for you to be able to share experiences and ask questions. So uh, um, yes, please do actively participate in our discussion today. Okay, so before we get started straight into the flow, I want to uh, hand over to one of our panelists today, Jermaine, who will be talked from Oxfam, who will be sharing a bit about the Admir Partnership Group. Yes, over to you, Jermaine. Hi everyone, uh, good morning. And, and just to introduce uh, APG, for some of you who might not be familiar, uh, Admir Partnership Group or APG is a, a network of NGOs working with the ASEAN Committee on Disaster Management, the AHA Center and the ASEAN Secretariat to ensure people-centered implementation of, of Admir or what we call the ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Response. We also work closely with and connect with uh, different uh, local and national actors and NGOs uh, from different countries. And as you can see, uh, our vision and our goal uh, is really to focus on, uh, vision is to focus on vulnerable groups in ASEAN are, are resilient uh, through, to our work and making sure that there are regional and national policies uh, and local action that support that. Uh, our goal is that uh, the Asian civil society organizations continue to work together and work with the different management uh, disaster management institutions uh, through through the use of uh, through the admir and different uh, types of uh, policies in place next slide please and just to show you these are currently the members of, of apg at the moment uh, oxfam uh, is lead and world vision is the co-lead uh, for this group of uh, organizations next slide please and just to quickly share, uh, these are uh, four of the main uh, uh, objectives that APG is working on. Uh, the first one is on advocacy, uh, ensuring that there's a strong regional CSO body uh, to represent the interests of vulnerable groups. And this, this involves working with, uh, again, with local organizations, local and national organizations, and, and acting as a, a counterpart to, 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 the, to the work of, of, of ADMR in terms of implementation using the, the, the work of uh, using our partnership as a, a strong mechanism. There's also a pool of uh, technical expertise that, that we can harness uh, to support that work. Uh, partnerships, uh, a lot of collaboration, uh, a lot of networking, a lot of working with different agencies, and we're going to hear a lot of that as well uh, during this, uh, this webinar. And lastly, uh, is, uh, APG works uh, really strongly on coordination, especially uh, focusing on preparedness and response. So supporting regional CSO bodies uh, in coordination with the AHA Center, the different uh, uh, disaster management agencies, uh, making sure that uh, there's strong interagency coordination uh, and cooperation in emergency response through, through existing mechanisms and ad hoc solutions when needed. And yeah, if, if you have any questions, please do reach out to us and we're happy to, to share with you what APG is. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Kea. Thanks. Thanks, Jermaine. So as I said, we've got a great lineup of speakers today, and so you can see them on the screen. We'll introduce as we go through, but we've just to let you know, we've got uh, Oxfam Plan, Help Age, Mercy Malaysia, the AHA Centre, Save the Children, and Code NGO with us today. So in for a good discussion. We'll go straight into it. And so if we can go to the next screen. Thanks. Wanted to ask Mr. Angelo Militino or Anan, um, the Regional Preparedness and Response Specialist, you know, within the region, it's been hit by a number of disasters on top of countries dealing with COVID. So if you can share from your perspective, what are some of the lessons that you've been learning and that which may affect your future planning as well? Thanks. Over to you, Anan. Okay, so before I, I start my sharing, let me just briefly give uh, information about Plan International. So 
our organization is responding to humanitarian needs brought about by COVID-19 uh, in 15 countries in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, this is on top of uh, the ongoing response, for example, Bangladesh and Philippines. And uh, like many other organizations, we also responded to several crises uh, while COVID-19 is uh, ongoing. So we have flooding in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, um, volcanic activity in Indonesia. And uh, we think that uh, the most significant recent ones would be the, the flooding in Vietnam and the typhoons in the Philippines. Uh, so uh, regarding responding to disasters in the context of COVID-19, first is that we we found that um, our disaster preparedness actions have been significant, uh, so have been very helpful. So we have uh, what we call the hotspot analysis, uh, which we produce quarterly uh, to help us anticipate uh, potential disasters. And uh, so, for example, we know that it's typhoon season in, in the Philippines and Vietnam, so we make sure that we are prepared for the next quarter. What are the preparedness actions that we need to take? Um, and we do this regionally and globally so that we understand what the regional offices and uh, the global offices need to prepare to, to support the country offices. Uh, to, to, so to some extent, we have anticipated the responses in Vietnam and, and the Philippines, and we did some uh, uh, preparedness actions. But of course, we are not a perfect organization, and we have uh, faced a lot of challenges, but um, the, the preparedness actions have, have helped us a lot. Uh, second point um, under one is uh, the years of influencing. So our uh, years of inlo influencing have uh, a lot of advantages. No, it, it was easier for us to work with governments uh, during the crisis to push for specific agenda for vulnerable communities. Um, so for example, in, in Bangladesh, the government uh, has issued a directive uh, to limit the access to refugee camps. Uh, so that uh, made uh, at least reducing the number of humanitarian, humanitarian workers at least by 80 no? percent. Um, but nonetheless, because of our previous uh, influencing efforts in these areas, case management services to protect children and youth has been considered a critical service. Uh, so which uh, gave priority to humanitarian organizations that, you know, support that provide such kind of support. Uh, third, uh, maintaining relationships. So our existing networks and partnerships have helped make anticipatory actions. You know? So um, so structures would be different per uh, per country. So for example, in Vietnam, they don't have a humanitarian country team, but they have a strong uh, government-led uh, coordination mechanism. And the Philippines, we have the UNHCT, but also, of course, we have government agencies uh, as, as counterpart. So, uh, uh, Nonetheless, despite these differences, you know, uh, these networks have have helped uh, generally make uh, quicker actions and uh, more efficient uh, because of these established working groups. Um, another example is that in Bangladesh, you know, UNFPA was quick to tap plan uh, to help uh, respond to the floods before the flood was part of anticipatory action. And this was made possible because of you know the, the relationship between a UNFPA and plan. Uh, and also highlighting our coordination with the AHA Center uh, with the Vietnam floods and the typhoons in the Philippines. So the, the AHA Center has helped broadcast the priority needs of communities and as well as the, the, the activities that humanitarian agencies are doing on the ground. Uh, so we give thanks to the AHA Center for that. Uh, continued response. So the, the fourth picture then under number one is continued response. Uh, so uh, plan uh, was still in the response mode when the, the new disasters happened, new emergencies happened. So it wasn't a challenge for us to shift the mindset of staff from uh, development of humanitarian because we are already doing a, a response. So it was uh, you know, easier for us because the system's already in place and the teams that were deployed uh, already know the protocols and safety measures. So we have a quicker deployment, quicker boots on the ground, um, so that helped us, uh, you know, respond to the, uh, the 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 new disasters. Second point, uh, the response also responds to exacerbated humanitarian needs. So as as we all know, COVID nineteen has pushed poor families even poorer. Uh, vulnerable groups became more vulnerable, um, and the response now considers this. You know, for for a, for example. Uh, Plan International is less likely to do emergency response in areas that are, uh, you know, regularly visited by disasters. 
for the fact that families and the government have already preparedness actions because of the, these are recurring events. No, um, but uh, for this instance, um, food stocks, for example, of families in uh, Vietnam that were affected by floods have already been consumed because of uh, the, the lockdown uh, for COVID-19. No, so because they don't have uh, that kind of support, so plan uh, provided food support to these uh, communities. Uh, in the Philippines, cases of uh, online exploitation uh, of children has risen because of the pandemic. And in, in Bangladesh, uh, you know, girls have been engaged in uh, child marriage. So we also did some advocacy and influencing efforts you know, to, to help address these concerns. Um, third, uh, we became creative in facilitating community engagement, and I think this is across uh, the humanitarian sector you know, because we, we, we understand that there is a limitation of uh, people going to the ground to do face-to-face -face community engagement. Um, so I'll just give you two examples of how we became creative, quote-unquote. No? So, for example, for Vietnam, we have the youth ambassadors from the communities where we have worked for years. And these youth ambassadors were the ones who sent us the videos of what is happening on the ground uh, when at the start of the onset of the flooding. No? So they gave us a picture of uh, you know what's happening on the ground and uh, what are the priority needs of the community and how it's going to shape the, the response. Similar to the Philippines, we have the youth reporters, uh, which we have ongoing for, for a number of years now. Uh, and the youth reporters have helped us disseminate life-saving information through local radio stations, to uh, mobile uh, speakers, and uh, uh, through online platforms. And then uh, lastly, so for number four, uh, I, I'm giving emphasis to the cash assistance, which has um, been particularly helpful for the responses. Um, and the, the icons I used there were from Ocha, so thanks to Ocha. But I'm just I'm just showing that uh, you know the airports have been uh, are not operational or mi operating at the minimum. Uh, so borders closed, ports closed, bridges, etc. So um, so the the the, the companies, uh, the service providers, which usually we we run to 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 buy products which become humanitarian aid, like for example, hygiene kits and water kits. They operate on a skeleton uh, or a minimum minimum scale or not at all. Not at all. So, it was, so it was so it was a challenge. Sorry, I'm I'm hearing echo. So if someone can mute. Uh, okay. So thank you for that. Um. So uh, the, the it was it was possible to uh, it was a challenge for us to do large scale procurement. So it was very helpful for us to do the direct. Uh, cash assistance to beneficiaries to address this so they can buy in you know local markets and uh, uh, local stores helping uh, local economy and also at the same time helped us adhere to COVID-19 protocols because it meant less lesser staff on the ground uh, lesser face-to-face -face engagement um, and that's that's all for me thank you very much Thank you, Anand. Um, really interesting how the being able to adapt and show the the innovations of being agile, and I think the importance you've raised on disaster preparedness and how you're able to build on a lot of those existing relationships, existing policies, uh, and programs that you had in place before. I think this leads nicely into our next speaker, which is Mr. Jermaine Baltazar Bayer from Oxfam International. You know, uh, as Anand was just sharing, you know, COVID has forced us to be more innovative um, in terms of how we respond. And I'm wondering if you can share from Oxfam's perspective about some of the innovations and new partnerships that you've been doing to uh, adapt to this new normal. Over to you, Jermaine. Thank you, Kea. And yeah, um, that, that's a good uh, uh, question. And, and just to note that I'm sure many of us uh, attending in this call uh, had to, to be very creative in, in, in how to respond to, to COVID-19 and on top of the different disasters. Uh, new collaboration, new partnerships, and new ways of working. And, and what I'm going to share to you is how is Oxfam working with the private sector during the COVID-19 uh, response and other emergencies. Uh, so yeah, so we're also responding in a number of countries. Uh, but on top of that, uh, we've seen in the last few months, there's a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, cyclone in, in, in South Asia and most recently floodings and, and typhoons in, in Southeast Asia. So that's really quite, uh, quite a compl complex uh, situation we are in. And just to, to briefly share with you the experience of Oxfam with the private sector. So a quick snapshot of the different uh, examples of private sector organizations that we are working with. And we're working with them in different uh, modalities. So some of them might be uh, providing funding support, like for example, Unilever, Visa, and Microsoft. So for Unilever, we're working with them in Nepal and, and in the Philippines uh, on hygiene behavior. Uh, hygiene behavior change, uh, ensure uh, risk uh, uh, communication, and and supporting ensuring communities uh, understand what COVID-19 is and and are are able to to reduce the risk and mitigate the impact of of, of that. So there's also uh, companies that provide services. So uh, we're we're uh, I'm sure many of the, us uh, do that, and there are uh, groups that are. Uh, that provide technical expertise. For example, Global Parametrics, which is uh, well known in terms of um, uh, climate modeling and 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 uh, doing some work uh, supporting us in the anticipatory action uh, programming that we are doing. And the last group uh, that that I'm uh, quite familiar with are those are strategic partners, private sector uh, engagement that goes beyond uh, just a contractual agreement, but we we co we we co develop programs. We think of ways to, to further enhance programming and and really work together uh, to to, enhance, to to make sure that humanitarian action is is, is better. Next slide, please. Uh, and and uh, just to, to zero in on on one of the experiences, I'm going to focus on the Philippines, where we are working with Paymaya. Uh, Paymaya is a mobile uh, platform application that provides services in terms of mobile money. Uh, online transactions and all these things. Initially, it was uh, designed for urban. Uh, uh, the target uh, uh, client for PMI was uh, the urban population, the young urban professionals, as they, as they say. Uh, but uh, but as a learning from from uh, our learning from Haiyan, we saw the need to to co-develop and and see how a a digital uh, platform can can help. Uh, ensure that we are quicker and faster and safer. So for the COVID-19 response, uh, the team uh, used a digital cash transfer uh, mechanism through the provision of an electronic pre prepaid card. And this helped because it will reduce the, the virus transmission uh, and, and manage uh, safe and quick uh, transparent cash transfer. So they don't have to line up. They don't have to stay and wait for the money to be given to them. They can just receive a text message saying that, oh, the money is there already in your account. And 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 for for getting the, for using the money, you ca you have a variety of options. You can just use it uh, to purchase directly from the supermarket, or go to the bank to withdraw the money, or uh, any other financial service providers. The money um, was around 100 US dollars, and and used to support uh, food and medicines and uh, different uh, essential needs during that time. Uh, and and one one key feature of this of this uh, product is that. Uh, aside from just giving money, it, it it was also offered a lot of financial services. So it contributed to to making sure that people uh, uh, are part of the financial inclusion uh, work, and 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 they are they have access to a variety of financial services. And and right now we're also uh, looking at how it it has evolved and and really be part of the disaster preparedness. So we've, we've piloted a number of uh, cases as part of the typhoon and even for the COVID-19 uh, for uh, anticipatory action. So making sure that people are re uh, well prepared uh, for any uh, shocks that may come. Uh, and, and the last, uh, last uh, engagement uh, I uh, that we have with Paymaya is now, they've, they've also included uh, Oxfam together with other organizations for fundraising. So as you can see in the, in, in the photo, uh, those who, ha, do are, who are interested to, to donate money to these organizations can easily go online and, 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 uh, and, and donate. So that's one platform as well uh, that, that has evolved uh, with this engagement. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so so how, how was that experience? And, and I'm, try, I'm going to share with you a number of key learnings, both uh, pre-COVID and, and during COVID. Uh, that can that that probably can can uh, capture what what's our experience like working with the private sector, uh, and and the use of new technologies. One, it's important to to 
to have partnerships that add value, not only for your organization, but also for, for uh, both parties. And, and that's important to sustain and to, to make sure that, that the relationship will, will last and be really, really fruitful. Uh, the other point is uh, on when you are thinking of new approaches, uh, sometimes we tend to say that, okay, we need to invest on this. We need to invest on, on people. We need to invest on technical capacity. When in fact, uh, there's also the option. If you're looking at new approaches, try to scan the horizon. Look for new partnerships. There might be uh, uh, private sector, academe, technical experts or groups who have that necessary expertise and who can provide that uh, instead of you uh, uh, investing. The third point is uh, the importance of working with the ecosystem. You have to understand the existing system. Uh, who are the agencies and the stakeholders involved? What are the infrastructure that, uh, that is available? Uh, how is the people or the community, the end users uh, uh, using this technology? Or what are they using now? What's the situation like? That will help you uh, understand, are you filling a gap? Do you need to bring in something new? Or do you need to innovate? Or do you need to just uh, improve an existing system? Uh, one, one thing is that uh, this will help because of uh, Paymaya having a platform already, this will uh, uh, ensure that even beyond the, the project's life or even Oxfam support, the, 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 the system will, will work. The, the fourth important point is, uh, I'm sure many of us, when we are introducing new technology, uh, are we uh, thinking about inclusion? How about the elderly? How about the persons with the disability? Uh, how are they uh, going to make use of this new technology? Uh, what's our uh, mitigation measures? What's our options? And if, if the new technology is not really possible, what's the option for them so that they will not be excluded in any support or any uh, uh, space for participation? So we need to think about that as well. And, and sometimes you need to make a decision this is not applicable, so we have to use another method. Uh, a platform for everyone. When we started uh, building this, uh, this work with, with uh, Paymaya, uh, around for the first uh, year and a half, we're, we're looking at, it's, it's Oxfam branded. But we felt that for a platform to, 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 to evolve, to be appreciated by more people, to be utilized by more people, it has to be a platform that, that can be open to them. So we, we've removed the branding, we've, we've said this is something that anyone can use. And in our experience, we've offered it to UN agencies who've used it, uh, a number of INGOs have used it, a number of local organizations have used it. And we felt that uh, that's our contribution. We don't need to have uh, our name there. Uh, and, and we do hope that people, uh, uh, make use of it, and this will help uh, our humanitarian response, especially now in the time of COVID. And um, enhance humanitarian approach. We continue to think about how to make things better, how to 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 thinking about the community, thinking about the affected community. How how will it be more transparent for them? How will they be able to participate? How will they have uh, an an input to, to the work that we're doing? So. Uh, we're, we're, we're uh, communicating, we're engaging, we're, we're asking them how is the experience uh, and, and all sorts of things. So hopefully uh, this will further uh, improve uh, the work that we are doing. Uh, safe programming. How do we make sure that whenever we work with the private sector uh, or any organization for that matter, how do we make sure that we reduce the risk to communities, to staff and to partners and to, to everyone? And that, that, that should always be uh, on top of our minds. And, and the last point that I'm going to share is uh, uh, on knowledge and learning. We continue to learn and improve. We, as I mentioned, we go back to the users. We, we ask the partners what works, what, what did not work, how can we improve the system, or uh, uh, how can we better uh, make sure that it's, it's appropriate and relevant to, to, the, to the communities we serve. And, and we, we build evidence so that uh, if, if some organization or anyone who's interested to learn about it, uh, we're very open to share and, and, and work with them. And yeah, that's it uh, from me, Kaya. Uh, I hope I answered your question. Thanks.
Thanks, Javed. No, they really did. And I think one, the breadth of private sector partnerships, not just as funders, these more innovative approaches, but this through line you had from learning from Haiyan to applying to the response and now thinking about anticipatory action for future and co-creation with communities and this learning by doing approach, uh, I think uh, something of real value in taking forward. Um, we're now going to move on to Ms. Dini Lin Onkapo, the Officer in Charge and Deputy Executive Director for Code NGO in the Philippines. Dini, you know, as Code NGO is one of the, is the largest coalition of NGOs in the Philippines working across that development humanitarian space, and you've had to deal with this multi-hazard environment that we're in. Can you share from your experience and of those of the members as well, how you've had to adapt uh, to this changing environment and some of the lessons for that. Thanks, over to you, Dini. Yes, thank you, Kaya. Um, let me start with the first slide. Mafe, can you please show the first slide? By the way, I am, I am right now with uh, my colleague from the organization, Ms. Mafe Del Mundo, is uh, with me right now in this forum. She's the program officer for membership as well as uh, uh, officer in charge for coordinating with uh, um, 10, 10 regional CSO uh, DRRM hubs that we have organized a uh, few years ago. <clears throat> Mafe? Can you allow me to share? Ah, one moment. There, okay, thank you. Okay, I'd like to, to start our uh, sharing with this slide. Uh, six months uh, down the road, since Luzon was placed under enhanced community quarantine in March, we received a message from our Honorable Vice President, Lenny Robredo, who gave recognition uh, to the work of CSOs of Code NGO, our members and our partners during this difficult time. Um, her recognition strengthens our resolve. And she said, she reminded us very confidently, we are made for times like this. And so as we reflect on what we have done these nine months, we at Code NGO says, yes, indeed, we are. Next slide, please, Mav. Okay. So when, uh, when, when Luzon was placed under ECQ uh, on March 15, majority of code NGOs member networks, uh, we, we reactivated, we activated them and um, asked them to also reactivate the regional DRRM CSO coordination hubs in 10 regions of the country. And uh, the hubs, uh, the hub conveners, we met them regularly, something like weekly, I think, where uh, in those meetings, we supported one another. Uh, we took the, the opportunity to share experiences uh, that we saw at the local, happening at the local level. We discussed action steps and exchange response efforts and good practices and started to coordinate. Next slide, please, Ma. So, um, there were many response, uh, COVID-19 response initiatives that came, up, came out from, the member, from our member networks um, and the coordination hubs. Some of them were uh, coordination among and within the members. We built also partnerships. We conducted household level surveys, community assessments, did mapping work and planning. We also uh, intensively uh, did information and education campaigns and risk communication in the communities. Um, cash and food relief efforts for staff, member organizations, partner communities, and frontline health workers. Um, some of our member networks, uh, one, one member network particularly, um, offered online psychosocial intervention for frontline workers and communities. We also monitored government interventions on COVID-19 and did fundraising activities. The photo that you're seeing right now in front of you is a, is a snapshot of the many stories that we have published 
on a dedicated web page on our website. These are stories that came from the member networks and from the or from the regional coordination hubs of what were happening at that time or during those uh, those months in the communities. No, so the dedicated the dedicated web page is is at uh, is on our website www.codengo.org slash covid slash so we continue to document the story still today next slide please Mafe. um in relation to fundraising activities um three national member networks of code ngo um did extensive fundraising for example, we've listed them there in front of you, as you can see. Um, member corporate foundations of the Association of Foundations, as well as the parent corporations of these foundations, have uh, so far contributed around 3 billion pesos in their COVID-19 response. Um, Philippine, the Philippine Business for Social Progress, which is a coalition of um, companies or corporations, uh, it was able to raise around 133 million pesos through a very creative fundraising activity called the Bayanihan Musikahan Project, which, is, uh, which was an online concert that uh, National Artist for Music, Ryan Kayabyab, um, led or organized, and he invited um, famous um, Filipino artists to perform during that, that period. So that uh, project was helped raise 133 million pesos in cash and in, in kind for the projects of PBSP. Another, another national web network, the Philippine Partnership for the Development of Human Resources in Rural Areas, um, was able to raise from external sources um, by their members and their partner, partners an amount of 44 million pesos which help their partner communities. And then the other co uh, Code NGO Hub members in different regions of the country um, were able to mo mobilize an estimated amount of 7.9 million pesos in cash and in-kind contributions and uh, volunteering services to serve uh, communities where, where, they were, where they are located. Next slide, please, Matt. <clears throat> we did not only look outward, um, but it was really during this time, I think, that we gave value and importance to the work of the coalition, and we started taking extra care uh, of our secretariat and the board. So the code secretariat uh, had, had weekly sessions to assess the current situation, in our own, in our families, in our own communities, at a very personal level, as well as the the work that we are doing, uh, since the community quarantine was declared in March. In addition, uh, the board, uh, which which uh, meets uh, quarterly for the past years, started meeting online on a monthly basis. So in these uh, meetings, we exchange notes with each other assess the impact of the pandemic and other emerging issues to our work and how we could respond as a network and as individual uh, networks, as a coalition and as individual networks. We also uh, activated our Calamity Fund to support member networks during, this, uh, during the crisis. The main objective of the, of the Calamity Fund is to provide quick relief assistance to member networks or their members or their staff who were significantly affected by COVID-19. Um, a, a total of about, a total of about close to 200,000 pesos um, was successfully distributed to 32 staff of eight uh, member networks of Code NGO to augment their salaries or support uh, their families during the lockdown, during the lockdown. Um, we also extended additional communication support to our member network so um, they could be assisted with regards to coordination and um, operations while uh, everyone was um, everyone um, had restricted mobility during the during the 
early five months since uh, the quar community quarantine was declared. And then we also organized capacity building um, seminars for our member networks to help them um, develop some skills relevant in the new normal, like um, how to facilitate online meetings and, and related topics. Next slide, please, Matt. Just a couple more minutes, Danny. Thanks. Yes. Okay. So um, last September, we celebrated our General Assembly and Social Development Week, and we focused on not anymore, not, not so much on what the problems are, problems were, but on what solutions um, have communities found when they were um, coping with the pandemic. So we we featured uh, work of um, member networks who cared for carers and frontline workers through remote response on mental health and psychosocial support. We the the social development week also value the responsive leadership, innovation, and compassionate management that happened in various cooperatives uh, around the country. And we also talked about promoting food security and multi-stakeholder collaboration. In the end, we two major lessons that we learned from, from this um, public forum were, number one, we have that empowering mindset. The civil society sector is actually a source of many innovations during that time. And our, we may be limited with, our, with regards to financial resources, but our wealth lies in our social capital. The trust that the partner communities have um, on us and trust building is our investment and that support giving is really extensive in the communities. And then so we want, we, as next steps, we want to widen the conversation. We want to engage more sectors and more organizations because as communities draw strength from each other, we, we saw that innovations are born. Next slide, please, Matt. And then in our general assembly, we, the, the members of Code NGO came up with two major resolutions. The first one is that um, Code NGO is to monitor, study, and address the effect of COVID-19 pandemic on CSOs in the Philippines and to facilitate and innovate ways for its members to synergize strategies during these trying times. <clears throat> the second resolution um, calls us to deeply reflect and recalibrate our policies, programs, and projects um, that, so that we could stay relevant um, and pursue the, in, the, in the next immediate years as we, um, we move, we recover, we start to recover and move towards a better normal. And then Code NGO is tasked to provide additional technical support to its members in enhancing its uh, systems of internal governance so that the systems are appropriate and agile for the needs of, of the uh, new normal period. And lastly, so uh, we end our sharing with this uh, slide. Um, Code NGO would like to see, of course, our country succeed in controlling the spread of the virus in saving lives and providing safety nets for the most vulnerable. Uh, but from within our capacities, we aim to support efforts to all uh, efforts to support efforts of all stakeholders from local from the local level to the national level. Um, we aim to win over this crisis through peaceful, participatory, and empowering means. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dee. I think you said it well in the beginning of the slide when it's like we were built for this and recognising the social capital, uh, like you said, that you have, which is a huge asset and taking that forward uh, in your resolutions and strategic planning. Um, at this point, I really want to, uh, we're really lucky and want to call on Adelina Kamal, the Executive Director of the AHA Centre, maybe just to share some of your reflections on, you know, as we've heard this discussion so far, if you're seeing similar trends or as and also some of the adaptations that the AHA Centre has had to make in responding. Over to you, Adelina. Sorry, I need to uh, unmute myself. Can you hear me and see me? Yes, perfectly. Thanks. OK, uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, APG members, for inviting the AHA Centre to participate in this uh, webinar and also the co-convener. Uh, of the humanitarian uh, partnership event, uh, UN OCHA. Um, 
I, I just uh, texted Vanda to uh, reconfirm how old APG is. And she confirmed that the APG was born in 2009 when the ASEAN Committee on Disaster Management was about to start developing the uh, ATME work program uh, for 2010-2015. And that was over uh, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, APG, uh, in fact, is older than AHA Center. Uh, AHA Center just commemorated our ninth anniversary. And since the beginning uh, uh, or the birth of AHA Center, we have been working closely uh, with the APG. Uh, for example, in the ERAT deployment to ty Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, where the idea of one ASEAN one response uh, was given birth. Uh, uh, we had the support from uh, APG uh, deploying uh, some of your uh, colleagues. Uh, also, in the training of the ASEAN Emergency Response and Assessment Team, ERAT, uh, in the uh, uh, contingency planning, and so many others. So, we, uh, we would like to thank uh, uh, APG for the support so far, and we look forward uh, to uh, continue our collaboration to, uh, with you. Uh, uh, second, uh, I'd like to reiterate what Kea mentioned. Uh, but in addition, I would like to add uh, some more key learnings uh, generated from the talk as well as from uh, what I have observed uh, in the past one year. There are nine key learnings. Uh, one, of course, the local actors. Uh, second, agility. Third, the collaborative nature that is required to go through this uh, difficult time. Fourth, the fact that we need to uh, consider additional layers of risk in our risk assessment. Um, and that's what also we are uh, uh, trying to uh, do uh, in AHA Center uh, uh, under our uh, uh, monitoring system. Fifth, uh, the fact that COVID-19 uh, further exposed uh, existing vulnerabilities and gaps, and that uh, we need to see. But I would like to add uh, four more uh, uh, from what the speakers, the other speakers have said. That is the, the use of digital uh, platform and creative uh, uh, IT solution that uh, could help promote uh, inclusivity. Uh, though at the same time, I also need to um, remind all of us to ensure that the digital platform and the creative uh, uh, IT solution will not actually uh, widen further uh, digital divide. Uh, we are coming uh, from a region that is quite uh, IT uh, adaptive. So hopefully that, that will not be a problem uh, in the future, but this is also something that we need to uh, continue to look at. Uh, number seven will be knowledge and lessons. Uh, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, including Southeast Asia, is a region that has experienced uh, uh, world-class disasters yeah, for uh, more than 10 years. Um, and, and therefore, it is uh, important for us to reflect on that. And I, I love what Germany said, um, reflect from Typhoon experience, but also see how we can actually utilize the experience from uh, responding to uh, disasters in the midst of uh, COVID-19. Number eight, safety first. And it's not only physical safety uh, of our first uh, responders, but also the mental health, the psychosocial uh, support that we need to provide uh, for our first responder. And that, I think, should not be uh, uh, underemphasized. We need to actually put that uh, as a priority. And number nine, nine and this is coming from uh, code, uh, the fact that our region is uh, resilient that resources are not on uh, necessary financial resources, but also uh, 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 other uh, type of uh, resources. And I think we need to uh, uh, add, we need to capitalize on this uh, further and make our region to become the model for other regions in the world. Now, um, since the theme of this uh, uh, webinar is about partnership, I need to mention about trust because trust is really the product and outcome of continuous uh, relationship and partnership building. Oh, sorry, Adelina, we just lost you. Sorry? Uh, we just lost you after trust building. Okay, so um, I will mention again. Hello, Kea, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect, thanks. Can someone confirm that you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we in. can hear you. Okay, now. Okay, now. Okay, now. Okay, so I'll... <laughs> uh, sorry for 
that. Um, so I'll, I'll mention uh, again about trust, since the conference is about partnership, right? So I think we need to really focus on uh, how we measure uh, the product of our partnership. And the product of our partnership uh, and relationship building is trust. And in terms of a, a crisis like COVID-19, you cannot search trust. You cannot begin the partnership in the hope of gaining trust in the heat of the moment. So you have to build the trust before you need it. And therefore, um, I think uh, uh, what we can what we can learn uh, from our uh, experience in the past one year uh, responding to uh, COVID-19, and this is not only for uh, AHA Center, but for everyone in the humanitarian community, is whether we have built the trust uh, enough uh, so far. Uh, what um, has happened so far, the fact that, for example, AHA Center has been able to respond and provide support to the government of uh, Vietnam and the Philippines, that also the result of the trust uh, building that uh, you know we have built over the Also, the relationship that uh, we have built with the UN, OCHA, with the WFP, with the private sector in the Philippines, allowing the HL and UPS to help us you know, in the movement of the relief items. Uh, uh, or with the civil society uh, sector. All of these are tested during uh, COVID-19, but uh, it was not actually uh, built during COVID-19 or uh, this year, it was actually built uh, uh, over uh, years of uh, uh, trust building. Um, second, as disaster managers, uh, we should have been able to adapt you know, better than the other sectors. So our uh, ability to adapt and to remain Agile is also tested uh, during COVID-19. Uh, I would like to offer um, a formula that uh, actually I didn't invent. I, I heard it from one of the uh, webinars organized by the Humanitarian Partnership Group uh, of ODI. And these are uh, the, the, the four A's. Anticipate, articulate, adapt, and accountable. And I think um, the first three have been quite prominent in the uh, presentations before. Yeah, we need to uh, to be uh, better anticipate. As disaster managers, we need to be uh, more anticipatory than uh, the others, right? We need to better articulate, and that relates to advocacy that what uh, Germany uh, mentioned. We need to articulate, you know, what uh, we have uh, built so far, so that the other actors will be able to convert, you know, to what we believe, and that uh, includes anticipatory action to allow for uh, uh, early action, and we need to be uh, more adaptive, uh, agile, creative, and innovative, and accountable. I think accountability is also important, and there is a digital platform that we can uh, utilize to ensure that uh, we are more accountable. Uh, so anticipate, articulate, uh, adapt, and ac uh, accountable. And with the COVID-19, there is no turning back. Turning, turning back. We cannot just have incremental steps, right? We need to uh, have transformative adaptation. And I think the 4A formula will uh, help us in this trans transformative adaptation. AHA Center just turned nine years old uh, last November, and our theme is transforming through uncertainty. And I think this is not only applicable to AHA Center, but every one of us, right? This is uncertain time, but we need to transform ourselves. We need to see whether our trust building efforts uh, is something that we need to improve further. And if there is anything that we can improve, what will that be? Because there will be more challenges in the future. Now may, may be COVID-19, but the future could be biodiversity collapse in view of the climate change. So I'll stop at that, and I, I look forward to listening to other presentations. Over to you, Kea. Thanks so much, Adelina. You gave us a great, I think, roadmap already for starting our discussion of the way forward. And I really liked your comment on you can't surge trust, you know, and that we have to be building, this has come a long time before in um, our action, not just at the time of COVID and needing to focus on that and our tra actions not needing to be transformative. Um, I think that will really help us when we start to go into the Q&A and everything. Um, I will ask if as well, we have our colleague Thomas Howell as well from Save the Children, if there was anything you wanted to share at this point in reflecting on some of the discussion we've had so far. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, and, and thanks to the three presenters for, for sharing those learnings and Ibu Adelina for her insights. Um, I think, you know, Save the Children is working in 18 countries across Asia and, and seven out of 10 ASEAN states. 
um, we support the COVID response, but also, you know, we've been responding with governments and civil society to the typhoon and severe flooding that's happened across the Philippines, Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, um, and a number of other responses across Asia. So um, there's just been an incredible strain on the on the system and our collective ability to support families in need in 2020. I think just in terms of the the presentations we've had, I just want to fully support the points made by plan around preparedness. I think um, we really have seen in COVID-19 and, and in the recent responses during COVID-19, just how important, you know, strong in-country operations planning and partnerships are. And I couldn't agree more with the point made by uh, Ibu Adelina around building trust. And I would really apply that to the partnerships um, function as well. I think uh, perhaps one of the positives that's come out of COVID-19, in, in my opinion, you know, from my perspective in uh, Save the Children, is that it has helped us move forward some grand bargain commitments that we've made. Um, and this has been highlighted by others, but just to restate those points, you know, the more of our aid going through um, cash interventions and being delivered alongside and through local entities. Um, I think both those things have really moved forward and they were identified by Plan and Oxfam. And I just wanted to kind of restate those. Um, I think, you know, it's been, it, I think most of us were already moving on that journey to try and do more on those two areas. But I think COVID-19 has really accelerated what was quite a slow journey. So in some ways that's quite exciting, um, I believe. Um, and in, in our responses, you know, in the last quarter, cash has been the primary modality in all and almost all, I think all, have involved um, implementation alongside or through a local entity, which is really exciting for Save the Children. Um, I think just to flag that uh, it was alluded to, but also to mention again that with the change in ecosystem of actors and um, you know, stronger um, participation, if you like, from civil society, that coordination remains critical um, and that we need to constantly evolve our ways of working to ensure our mechanisms align with that. Um, and that, that, you know, the growing local civil, civil society engagement um, is inclusive in the mechanisms um, that we're working in. We've seen that in Cambodia in our response there. Um, Save the Children uh, is the global education cluster lead. Um, and I'm pleased that as part of this continuing process to adapt, we're currently uh, with UNICEF delivering education coordination training for non-cluster countries across ASEAN, um, which includes civil society and Ministry of Education representatives, which is which is great. Um, I think just the final point, because I know we're we're kind of struggling for time, uh, Kea, is to say, you know, looking forward. We, we know that coping capacity of families has been severely impacted by COVID-19, right? Save the Children's research shows that 88% of people um, are struggling to pay for food. Um, children are feeling more worried and less hopeful. And unfortunately, a majority of children have been out of school for a long period. So while economies will start to recover in 2021, it's, it's also kind of clear that, you know, COVID-19 has undermined coping capacities. Um, and so there is going to be a continuing need from organizations like ourselves, governments, civil society, um, to work across development and humanitarian and focus on building back that resilient resiliency that's been lost. So, so yeah, those were a couple of my reflections from listening to those, um, those presentations. And um, yeah, look forward to hearing from the rest of the presenters. So back to you, Kea. Thanks very much, Thomas. And in that short, you were able to put coordination, the nexus and the grand bargain on the table. Really important discussions as well as we talk about the future of humanitarian. So thank you. Um, we're going to, like I said, go straight into the next part of the presentations. We're going to go to Dr. Heng from Mercy Malaysia. Mercy Malaysia is an organisation not only operating, obviously, in Malaysia, but across the region and a health service provider, one of the main activities. So if you could share with us, Dr. Heng, a bit about how you, Mercy Malaysia has had to adapt. Uh, both domestically and regionally would be great. Over to you. Thank you. Here, yeah. can everybody, can you hear me? All Perfect, click? thanks. Good, very good. Thank you so much. It's great to uh, see our, all our old friends back together. It's been a long time. Now, this COVID has really affected the way that we have worked and the way that we think. I think to share with you one of the big things that actually happened in Malaysia, even in a national uh, 
scenario is actually coordination, coordination, coordination. Never mind internationally. I will give you an example. In the first phase in March of COVID, the big thing that went out was, yes, you know, get ready for this. This is a bad respiratory disease. Yes, we will need ventilators and things like that. And every NGO started donating ventilators without a consultation with the Ministry of Health, how many was needed and, and, and uh, know where it would be. As a result, by the end of April, we had excess over maybe a thousand excess ventilators. So we had to tell people, please stop. Don't just donate. Donate what the Ministry of Health wants. I think coordination is very important. And if it, that doesn't happen, uh, you're going to end up duplicating a lot of your um, uh, donations. The second thing that we have learned also uh, in the national context, localization, because working from Kuala Lumpur, you can only deal with Kuala Lumpur. But when every state and every uh, village or big city outside Kuala Lumpur is affected, you need the local volunteers to be able to help out. You need them to be able to coordinate with headquarters. You need them to be able to communicate effectively with headquarters so that donations get through and also the work gets through. Never mind our international work, which is in Bangladesh and Philippines and, and, uh, and, and Myanmar. In fact, we begin to realize then how important it was for us to actually empower the local people so that in our absence, uh, they can actually carry on the work that uh, has been there. So this is the kind of things that uh, I would like to share with you. The other thing, which again was uh, sometimes we overlook it, is the psychosocial part of it. Uh, luckily, in Mercy Malaysia, we have a huge uh, psychosocial department, which has been in existence for a long, long time. Uh, but this is even more important now because the volunteers who are going out to provide the food, to, to do the swabbing, need to talk to the local population, to the locals there. In times like these, it's very important to be able to say the right thing, to say things that are comfortable, to say things that make the victims easier. Not only just to say things, but important thing is not to say certain things as well. So this training that we have now, which we put out to all our volunteers, is very important uh, in this period so that uh, they know how to be comforting to all those who are out there. People who don't have food, right, when we give them food packages, you must be able to say the right thing to them. Those who have relatives who are in hospital or locked up because of COVID or in quarantine, there are certain things that you must be able to say to them. So we started this huge training procedure for all our volunteers uh, online uh, so that they can actually get trained uh, on the psychosocial bit. And then we have another one which is online as well, which is run by all our psychosocial volunteers for people who are stressed and to be able to contact this particular number. Unfortunately, it's very much uh, this problem with our society. People who are stressed or people who have uh, emotional problems don't want to talk about it. Maybe it's a sign of weakness or whatever it is. 
and they keep it to themselves. And as a result of that, we have actually seen a huge rise in uh, gender violence. We've also seen rises in suicides as well. And never mind gender violence, but uh, you know, there are a lot of cases where um, divorces have happened, people have left home because of the stress and because of staying together and not being able to get out. And for this, uh, we have reached out to the people, we have you know, uh, advertised this number that you can call. I must say that in the beginning, there were quite a few people, but as the, the, the numbers of uh, people, uh, of infections go down, the calls are much less. But again, we have to be prepared because by the time you have the third wave, etc., you're going to have a lot more. So it's about anticipation. It's about preparation. So we thought that we were pretty well off by uh, April or May. We thought that we were over it. And then suddenly the second wave came along and it was a lot, a lot bigger than the first wave. And that really sort of, in a way, showed up how unprepared we were, actually. So now, having survived the second wave, we are actually getting prepared now more for the third wave. The other thing, of course, is that which we suffer is actually donor fatigue. In the first wave, there were lots of people wanting to donate and, and uh, you know, wanting to help. But the numbers were very small. So we managed to ride through it quite well. And then when the second wave came about, when there were so many more people, we suddenly realized that the donors were not giving any more money. And we actually then had to be, you know, try harder and be more innovative to go around looking for more financing and other forms of financing and partnership. So, I mean, this has helped us learn a lot and open our minds. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you very much, Dr. Hay. I think the importance like, of having to pivot your actions and recognizing, <laughs> yeah, the need, like you said, I think for um, having that model from the national to, you know, the community level and being able to provide that training capacity support for a really important need, which like I said, is the care of the health workers uh, as well themselves and the psychosocial support. And this leads us quite nicely as well into Mr. Deepak Malik's presentation, which is going from HelpAge uh, International, who we, you know, we this point has been highlighted and come through a number of the presentations about the risk that frontline workers are facing and the need not only for psychosocial and for the care um, for us to consider how do we provide that in this new normal and wanting to see if you could share a bit about how HelpAge, who deals with some of the more vulnerable populations, has been adapting um, to that. Over to you. Great. Mr. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, I, I would like to start uh, with the piece that Adelina had mentioned. Uh, can you please can you please go to the next slide? And and I think uh, uh, when when it occurred when everything started in March, uh, even I had a lot of travel plans, which uh, I had to cancel and, and and sit at home and start working from home. Uh, things happen. I think everybody must have seen kindergarten, schools, colleges, workplaces getting closed down. And and everything was in a chaotic situation, and and work life balance was just getting nowhere, and everybody was uh, in in a, in a real chaos. Uh, not only that, and I think with with that, a lot of people feared that what is going to happen with what the work which they were doing. Mm, it was it was about the job security. It was about the way they were working. It was about the health situation of. Uh, uh, I mean, when when I came to the city where I live in in Jaipur, it was about uh, that how many cases are there in the city. But then things getting uh, started getting closer. Then I heard that a lot of people are uh, getting affected with COVID within the building and. Uh, 
it it was in the building then it was in the house and 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 everywhere you could see that i mean uh, there is there is an anxiety and with that anxiety i think we were losing we, we all had problems of uh, um, motivation to keep working motivation within uh, oneself motivation within the team and within the organization to make sure that we all work for the cause for which we have been working and and that required a lot of motivation lot of things so uh, as 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 institution uh, i would like to highlight a few things which we have uh, been doing which we have done uh, can we go to the next slide a lot of things have already been mentioned uh, by the previous uh, speakers and i'll not repeat those uh, we'll just try to focus on uh, something which we have been doing uh, i think uh, to one of the things which we immediately did was an additional insurance if anybody required an additional insurance to make sure that they are covered for uh, covered for their health for their medical insurance second is uh, immediately working from home uh, with all the uh, equipment required uh, computer internet and uh, for example i didn't had any any space for myself working from home i mean i didn't had any room uh, which i could have uh, thought of as so so i think at institutional level we 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 supported people so that they can have table chairs basic equipment internet uh, with which they can work and uh, be comfortable working a uh, lot of scheduled trips were cancelled and and i think all these things are going going to get into new normal we we all will be working from home uh, as more and more we will we will need more insurance we will have to uh, have new norm for traveling we will have to have new partnerships as german has said uh i think partnerships are going to be key and localization is going to increase as we move forward the way in which humanitarian world is working is going to change in a drastic manner uh second is uh, as i mentioned i mean there was anxiety uh, within with with everybody people were getting affected the families were getting affected there uh, was an anxiety uh in on on how things will happen and and that required uh, you know a uh, lot of discussions regular discussions on a regular basis that also required trainings on personal development on leadership uh, on on how we should be working uh, how we should be leading our own teams in in such times uh and and and, and a work life balance and also making sure that we we make sure that we we ensure work life balance i mean we living in asia a lot of times have you know different uh, so if if you have to work with london you i mean you start late if you have to work with the um, asean i mean you work early and and if you have to work uh, with the us then you have to work at night so or or very early morning so i think these these changes have also earlier because you were working from everybody was working from the office most of the times we stick to the times but now with with this change that had also come that work life balance had got disturbed and everybody needed some kind of consolation and one to one discussion personal trainings ensuring availability of support uh, from uh, uh specialist doctors was very much important so that uh, people uh keep moving on thank you and uh, can we go to the next slide please there were a lot of mitigation measures as as i think everybody must have uh, uh taken first of all following country and who guidelines and these guidelines are going to even if and and i think if we look at the speculations uh, next year things are going to get normal and but but that is going to be new normal where we will have more and more guidelines on our travels on on how do we work even within our offices uh, so uh, maybe half of the time from the office and half of the time from home or a lot of people might will have to work full time from home 
and uh, travel the way in which tra- we travel is also going to change it is not going to be the same as we used to do it is going to be much and much lesser uh yes protective gears and uh, are are going to be important uh, the group activities are going to be much lesser uh and remote monitoring is going to come up in a big manner we we may have seen and 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 i can give you many examples of how uh, evaluations are conducted virtually we are talking about video chat interviews reliance on local resources for conducting field work for uh, evaluations and definitely i think the the way in which we are working as dr hang said localization local leadership is going to uh take a bigger role in the humanitarian work in coming times we will see uh thank you uh thank uh, thank you kya uh, over to you Yeah, thanks very much, Deepak, and highlighting the realities of the operational challenges we've had to adapt to. And like I say, the travel restrictions, the insurance, the protection that we're going to have to take forward and change internal policies. Um, that concludes, thank you for us today, the uh, panellists. But I want to again hand back before we open up to questions to Adelina after these additional presentations for any further re- reflections and, you know, like we said, start at the beginning, start thinking the beginning, about this, thinking um, about this. moving forward, um, the priorities. Moving forward, the priorities. Over to you, Adelina. Uh, thank you very much. Over Sarah. to you, Adelina. Thank you very much, Sarah. I agree yeah. to uh, everything that uh, Dr. Heng and uh, Mr. Deepak uh, have said uh, uh, on the importance of uh, uh, duty of care, psychosocial support, as well as uh, the fact that in the future, uh, through the lens or the uh, through, through the lens of uh, 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 Mr. Deepak, that the future will be different uh, uh, in terms of the way uh, of doing things. Uh, if you are in my, you are the same as me in terms of uh, generation or age. Uh, it was really different uh, the time when there was no email. Uh, then when the email uh, got introduced uh, to the workforce, then things change right, more rapidly. And I think uh, COVID-19 will also do the same wonder that things will be uh, 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 more rapidly and things, uh, more things will be uh, uh, done online or virtually. So uh, that uh, we will have to adjust uh, accordingly. Um, I guess uh, a few things that I would like to offer. One would be, uh, we need to uh, start thinking uh, and preparing internally first uh, uh, as an organization uh, as well as an individual. Uh, as an organization, for example, what uh, we have been doing in AHA, uh, AHA Center is to uh, put our thoughts uh, into a strategic direction paper that we presented to the governing board, our governing board that consists of the heads of the National Disaster Management Organization of the 10 ASEAN countries. Uh, what we uh, put there in the strategic uh, direction uh, paper of the governing board is what we think would be the the next, uh, you know, uh, uh, priority for the next uh, five years. Uh, how we redefine the future, what should be, um, you know, our, our priorities, how we move forward, and also how we uh, should regard uh, 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 issues such as. Uh, sustainability, resources, local, localization also uh, included in our paper, and also how we should deal with uh, additional tasks like responding with the, uh, uh, responding in conflict areas or uh, providing support to um, the health sector uh, when there is a pandemic. So, so I guess uh, all of us uh, internally within our uh, respective organization, we have to do that. If we have questions, uh, it would be good to put that all in, into the paper and consult either your governing board, you know, or your uh, vice president or your president on uh, on on the direction, you know, uh, for the next uh, five years, uh, reflecting uh, on the changes and the transformation that you have to undergo, and also uh, 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 taking into account the fact that uh, post conflict will take uh, not only one year but a few years, so we have to reflect uh, uh, on that and share this 
uh, to your governing board, you know, to your superiors, so that you have the you you are working on the same page. For us, it's important, yeah, to do that because we are working for the ten governments, uh, and we need to uh, make sure that you know what we are going to do is actually uh, uh, in consonant uh, with the ten governments in uh, ASEAN. And then uh, we also need to uh, communicate that uh, internally within our, our organization. As a leader, right, uh, uh, the number one in AHA Center, uh, uh, we need to communicate not only externally but also internally so that you know they can also uh, uh, copy and uh, help us uh, uh, in particular on, uh, on transforming our organization to uncertainty. Um, number two. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, the past one year is uh, uh, more tiring <laughs> than any other years. Uh, uh, even you know more tiring than the years when I travel a lot. And I think that is also due to the fact that uh, you know uh, it has been a hell of the year. <laughs> uh, so many challenges, uh, so many uncertainties. Right? Well, we we have also to respond to many things and also reflect and transform. And adapt at the same time, and bring it from home. Um, so I, I think uh, this duty of care, psychosocial support, uh, you know, needs needs to be prioritized because if you are not uh, 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 healthy mentally and physically, how how can we actually provide support to others? We are humanitarian workers. We are disaster managers, uh, and as a leader. I think uh, we need to be uh, uh, paying more attention, you know, to, to those inside the organization and also to ourselves. Uh, I'm I'm really grateful to the short message uh, sent by Dr. Heng to me <laughs> a week ago. Thank you very much. And the coffee uh, uh, package sent by Vanda uh, that actually reflect, you know, the kind of uh, support that you have from your peers and uh, your friends. And once in a while, you know, uh, even a leader of organization would benefit from that. Um, I guess uh, um, uh, only those two that I would like to offer, that is uh, uh, use the change of the year uh, to really reflect and prepare ourselves internally and externally uh, with our superiors on what we're going to do in the next five years or ten years in view of the uh, post-COVID. And then uh, number two, take care of ourselves. Over to you, Kea. Thanks, Adelaide. Thanks. They're both excellent messages to end on and institutionalising the adaptations we've made this year. We got we don't have much time left, so we want to throw it open to questions, and we already have two great ones. I'm going to start from the bottom and work up. We have a question. I think it was to. Uh, Deepak, more if you could elaborate about the virtual evaluations and that process. Uh, uh, thank you, Kea. Uh, we have just experimented a virtual eva evaluation uh, uh, for our Silavesi recovery project in Indonesia, where we have appointed uh, the experts uh, on the subject experts, different sub subject experts for uh, evaluating. So there are four external evaluators who are uh, uh, doing the virtual evaluation, and we have hired a local agency uh, um, in Indonesia so that they provide us with the field insights. So all the field insights uh, are taken with the video and uh, our evaluators were present when the interviews were taken. Uh, so that's how and, and the questions were given very clearly by the evaluators on what to ask and how to ask. Yeah, so so this this is what uh, is going on right now. Uh, once the report will be there, I think we'll have more learnings. Thank you, and over to you, Kia. Thanks very much, Deepa. Uh, we have another question now. I think for from Kunal, and I think it's to Heng, but maybe Dr. Heng, but more generally about you know we've the mention of GBV cases increasing and wanting to know you know the. Well, we recognise this, but if the actions that we're taking, if we have a sense of whether they're helping reduce or prevent cases. Okay, sorry. The, the question is, what can we do to prevent cases? Am I right? Or if we're seeing, yeah, the the cases are they change? The is that having an impact? Cases. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think the most important thing that we all have to realise, and this message actually had, you know, I mean, much has been tried, but it hasn't really got out. 
uh, let, it's, let's just get back to basics. COVID is spread by human beings, by close contact. If you stop that close contact, slowly the disease goes down. And this is the message that we have to put out and we have been putting it out. Unfortunately, in Malaysia, in, and I, I think it's probably all over the place, unfortunately, in spite of all this, maybe it is not clear enough, maybe it's not good enough, maybe people, it hasn't got into their brains yet. So they will wear a mask outside, they will wash their, the moment they go back to the villages, Right, the mask and everything comes back and the community gets back together. Or, you know, when they go for a, a, for a, a wedding or something like that, it doesn't have to be 20, 30 people. All it needs is more than 10 people or even 10 people. And the moment you forget about social distancing, the moment you don't wear your mask, the moment you don't wash your hands, it spreads. And for everyone that has spread, maybe, for every particular person who has got it, maybe another, he will probably spread it to another two or three. That is a sad thing. Uh, and we see this all the time. We put it out in our message, but obviously our message, our TV programs or whatever it is, is not good enough and it is not clear enough. Sorry, but that's the only other thing I can say. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Heng. Yes, the importance of messaging and effective messaging. We've got, do we have, we have a few more minutes. Do we have any other questions or responses to either Kanal's question here about the GBV prevention and actions? Um, or I guess a question maybe, oh, yeah, sorry, we've got someone with their hand up. Thunder, good. Yes, if you'd like to jump in. Yes, thank you. Okay, and thanks everyone for the, the interesting uh, sharing. Just basically, I put on the chat box uh, just to share that basically in Plan International, we have a number of intervention towards prevention of GBV. And then it's also, again, uh, promoting the collaboration with other agencies uh, in, in Cambodia. We work with Child Headline. Uh, and also uh, at the regional level, um, we release a, a kind of a press uh, a statement uh, to really emphasize to the ASEAN leader as well as uh, SARC to really emphasize on the importance of uh, child protection and together with, child, with Save the Children we also release uh, a publication called Because We Matter to really emphasize that uh, the protection issue towards girls, uh, women and then to prevent uh, and mitigate about gender-based violence is really important in terms of uh, COVID-19 response and uh, facing the other emergency that we have uh, in the region. So it's, it's, it's become very, very uh, important to consider about uh, this issue. Thanks, Kea. Okay, are you still there? Uh, okay, you are on mute. Uh, I think perhaps Kea have some um, technical issue. Yes, Badalina, if you would like to jump in, but to add on protection, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Vanda. Uh, I would like to convey good news uh, from the ASEAN family. Uh, first of all, uh, the new ATMEL work program uh, for 2020-2025 uh, has been endorsed by the ASEAN Committee uh, on Disaster Management just a few weeks ago. Uh, as you know, the development has been uh, led by the ASEAN Secretary together with the uh, uh, ECDM family as well as the AHA Center. And APG has been consulted uh, throughout the process. And I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad to uh, uh, inform you that uh, uh, you'll be uh, you'll be part of uh, the implementation as well, as there are some uh, activities related to civil society as well as uh, APG. Um, so please uh, uh, look at uh, our new admin work program. Second, and, uh, and this is related to protection. Just yesterday, uh, uh, there was uh, a new technical working group uh, on protection under our ACDM family. Just uh, met yesterday. 
And this is actually a new, new initiative under the uh, Atme Work Program uh, as part of uh, the commitment to further uh, uh, socialize, socialize, but also institutionalize the issues of uh, protection, uh, including for those who are uh, most vulnerable uh, and uh, children as well as uh, uh, women into the disaster response mechanism. And Aha Center uh, uh, has been also uh, supporting this uh, idea. And in fact, uh, we are looking into how um, the, uh, the protection guidelines that have been developed uh, in ASEAN together with the social welfare sector will be further streamlined uh, into the disaster response mechanism. But the fact that there is now a dedicated uh, sub-working group uh, under the ECDM family looking into the ideas of protection, I think something that uh, should be uh, capitalized uh, further by those who are interested in this issue. Over to you. Thanks, Adelina, for that really, um, for, for that interesting thing about the future opportunities there around the protection discussion. Um, we're just in, I realise we're already over. So to do a very quick wrap up from this, from all the excellent presentations that we've had and discussions, uh, experiences being shared, I guess maybe to leave a couple of reoccurring themes that came uh, across in today's discussion about understanding risk. And I think as Adelina had said earlier, understanding the layers of risk to help us with uh, the anticipation and being better prepared. And something that Jermaine and a lot of others came with is obviously building and doing that horizon scanning on what is already existing, understanding the social capital of local actors, understanding the complementarity of the different partners and that whole of society approach and the importance of coordinating that I think is something that came up um, repeatedly through the different discussions and the importance of duty of care and recognising that and having to look at how we do concretely adapt our ways in terms of moving forward and recognising the ecosystem that this is going to require that development humanitarian and looking at across uh, and not being siloed and changing the way our approaches are um, moving forward in the future. So I think that was a very, very brief summary of some of the um, messages that came out. I don't know if anybody, any of the panellists want to add anything that I, burning anything that I missed there. Otherwise, um, we'll wrap it up there. It doesn't look so. So I just again want to say thank you uh, very much to all the presenters uh, today and for everyone to take the time to join this discussion and hope that this discussion we continue to collaborate on and look at the way um, forward and how we integrate this into our practices. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.